Okay, that's working. Let's see. Yep, that's working too. Mm -hmm. Okay, Alma, so how do you want to do this? Are you going to introduce me briefly or do you want just want you to open yes. straight up or what should we do? Yes, we will introduce you uh, in the beginning and then uh, we will give the word to you. Okay. okay. Uh -huh. Thank you. Fine, okay. Yeah. And we have, this time we're five minutes early. This is good. Yes. Mm -hmm. So we still have five minutes. That's right. Okay, that's great. How is the weather outside? Uh -huh. It's, it's daytime. Uh, uh -huh. It's, it's bright sunshine. Uh, it's uh -huh. about two, two or three degrees below zero, a bit of snow, uh -huh. not too bad. Uh -huh. Kazakhstan, it must be quite cold right now. Uh, yes, however, in Almaty, it's quite warm. Like today, it was like plus four or five. Ah, so, so actually yeah. it was warmer than Almaty yeah. today. It was, it was in London, now that's unusual. <laughs> <laughs> spring is coming soon. <laughs> yes, yes, the, the first spring flowers are out here. It's very pretty. Uh -huh. Okay, I'll just go to these slides. Good evening, everyone. Hello, Janet. Hi, Janet. How are you? Good. Good afternoon. Uh, well, I do hear you very well. Thank you. You do? That's encouraging. I see you too. Did you try your presentation? Uh, yes, I, I was running through the slides just now. Uh, I haven't uh, done a share screen yet, but the slides appear to be all working. Okay. Great. Three minutes, we'll start, right? Okay, mm -hmm. standing by. Volume, everything okay, yes? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Alma, uh, you are moderating, is that right? Uh, yes, me okay. and Janat, we will be moderating <coughs> with the questions as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, now for the questions, how do you want to do this? Are you just going to ask questions off chat or are people raising hands or what do you want to do? Oh, regularly the uh, participants are writing their questions in Q&A or right. in the chat. So we will be looking at the, you know, like both locations, Q&A and okay, chat. Okay, but, 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 but you will read off the Q&A and you will put the questions to me, yes? Yes. Mm -hmm. I, do, I don't have to look at the Q&A myself. Okay, that's fine. Just because otherwise I, I end up switching the screen. Yes. Mm -hmm. Good. I'm going to turn this slightly. I'm going to try it. A bit more light. Normally, I have to put on extra light, but today there's snow glare, so I have to mm -hmm. close off light. It's uh... mm -hmm. okay. Janet, technical expert, is that lighting better than the one I had before or not? 
Or shall I go back to where? Yeah, it is. That's better. Okay, good. We'll go with that. No, it is better. Right. <coughs> ah, a COVID cough. <laughs> Take care of yourself. I don't want you dropping dead during the presentation. <laughs> But in fact, you have almost no COVID in Kazakhstan. Yes, I, I think you, you have cases, but very, really not, not many. We do, uh, we do. Compared to the number of population of our country, it's not that, you know, not that few. We do have, and there, there were some, you know, manipulation uh, by the officials in terms of statistics, which uh, most well, of the countries- Kazakh countries, officials manipulate statistics. I am shocked, shocked, yes, yes. But you, you, what you mean that the real total is higher than the official total, yes? Yeah, because for whatever reason, some of the pneumonia that we believe and the whole population believes was caused by, or at least triggered by COVID. They, for whatever reason, they were saying, oh, it's not COVID kind of picture and we don't count it as COVID. But everybody was like, are you kidding us or what? So we, we believe that uh, official statistics, it's different to what they report. Yes. Okay. Okay, we're at two o'clock. Alma, yeah. I'm in your hands. Over yeah. to you. Let us start. Mm -hmm. Let's do that. Good evening, everyone, every participant and guest, and our colleagues and our dear students, alumni and everyone who is supporting KMAP by you know, entering this event and by being with us. We're so happy that uh, you join us again and again. And um, as we started a series of various guest lectures, we try to bring very interesting people to talk to you. And today we are proud to introduce our distinguished speaker, Mr. John Everett, the former British diplomat and presently UN consultant. Mr. Everett is having nearly 30 years of career as a diplomat in four continents, Africa, Asia, Europe, and Latin America. And uh, he was the youngest ever British ambassador when he has uh, received his first appointment to Belarus in 1993, where, where he has built an embassy from the ground after the collapse of the Soviet Union. He also managed diplomatic relations as the UK ambassador to Uruguay in 2001, during the period of economic crisis and the country's election of its first left-wing government. Mr. Everett has also been an ambassador in North Korea, and he is the author of the book On the Beautiful Place about his experiences in that country. So let us welcome Mr. John Everett with the talk on international relations after pandemic. So, please. Thank you, Alma. <laughs> okay, Alma I, and Janet, thank you for those warm words of introduction. Good evening, everybody. And thank you very much for, for giving up uh, what is doubtless a beautiful spring evening uh, in Kazakhstan to listen to me. I, I hope that you uh, gain something from this and I hope you enjoy the lecture. Now, as you know from the programme, I hope to talk today about international relations after the pandemic. Uh, that is to say, effectively, uh, international relations... One moment. Let me get a slide up. Uh, that's to say how the pandemic is likely to affect international relations. Um, let me say from the outset that uh, having asked this very big question, I don't really have an answer. Uh, there are too many unknowns right now. It's still unclear which way a number of the dynamics are going to go. But what I do think we can do, even at this early stage, is to look back at what has happened in previous historical examples of this kind of pandemic and see what the determining factors were that uh, decided international relations after those events took place. But just before I, I, I do that, uh, I, I ought to point out that there is a great deal of, shall we say, noise in the system. Um, that is to say that although we can talk about uh, the effects of the pandemic, of course, the 
pandemic does not uh, affect international relations in a vacuum. Uh, there is a great deal else going on. I've just picked out four issues there. Uh, if I had more space on the slide, I could have picked out many more. And as in all events like this pandemic, it's going to be very difficult uh, in the future to disentangle which changes uh, in international relations, and there will be changes, but which changes were caused by the pandemic itself and which were caused by other things that were happening at the same time. So, for example, the rise of national socialism in China. Uh, the, the photograph at the top right of the slide there uh, is of uh, President Xi Jinping, who for the first time a couple of years ago, uh, wore military uniform on uh, Chinese Army Day, uh, indicating quite clearly the links between uh, the Chinese Communist Party and the Chinese People's Liberation Army. Uh, China has become uh, much more assertive, uh, much more expansionist, some would say, much more repressive, and also, importantly, much more bristle. Uh, President Xi Jinping has taken uh, almost complete power into his hands, but with complete power comes complete responsibility, which means that when things go wrong, and things do go wrong, uh, that he carries all the responsibility. This is a significant factor in international affairs. It's one with which uh, all countries, including, of course, the United States, is still grappling, and we don't yet know how this is going to work out. Talking of the United States, of course, as we all know, uh, we have a new US administration under President Biden. Uh, a lot of his policy remains unclear, it's still being worked out, and we are having this discussion uh, while the United States Senate is deciding whether or not uh, to impeach uh, President Trump, ex-President Trump, I should say. Uh, these are our big moments in American affairs. A lot of international relations depends on what America, as the world's largest economy and the world's largest military power, does. We still don't know that. And with those kind of questions in the air, the future is unusually difficult to predict. Third point, trouble in Russia. Uh, the photograph underneath uh, President Xi Jinping is, as you can see, the Oman in Russia dragging away protesters who were angry uh, at the treatment of uh, Navalny uh, just a few days ago. Uh, Russia is uh, in a febrile mood. It's not at all clear how this is going to end. It's not at all clear, uh, fourth point I wanted to raise as an example, uh, strange within the European Union. Uh, as you know, I am British, but I don't just mean uh, the exit from the European Union of the United Kingdom. There are all kinds of other strains too. Uh, new uh, dissident values in Eastern Europe, in Hungary and in Poland, causing real tension with Brussels, real problems with the budget and lots of problems over COVID. So altogether, when we talk about the effects of the pandemic, we are looking at these effects against a very complex and a very unstable background. Okay, how then might we set about thinking how the pandemic is going to change international relations. Uh, the most obvious way, uh, and one that I as a, as a boring civil servant will always go for, is to see what happened last time. Now, there have been previous pandemics. Uh, this is not the first time that the world or the known world has been swept by a disease. Uh, the picture at the top right there is of people trying to fight off bubonic plague. Uh, a figure of death, as you can see, uh, and uh, the poor man dying in his bed. Uh, the bubonic plague spread rapidly almost everywhere of the, uh, the European and, and Asian world, and uh, indeed uh, throughout much of Sub-Saharan Africa, much more lethal than COVID. And we can watch what happened after uh, the bubonic plague and draw certain conclusions. Uh, wars also, wars of course are not pandemics, but in some ways, they affect societies and they affect international relations in the same way. Just as in a pandemic, in wars, very large numbers of people die. Uh, the poor soldier there uh, at the bottom of his trench uh, is uh, just one example. The big difference between wars and pandemics in terms of predicting the future is that in wars, you also get massive physical destruction, physical infrastructure is destroyed, which mercifully 
is not the case in pandemics. So when you use wars as a precedent, I think you need to aim off just a bit. Uh, the picture at the bottom right there is of perhaps the most recent pandemic, uh, the, the one of Spanish flu. Uh, this photograph was taken actually in the United States uh, in 1919. Remember that that flu uh, right at the end of the First World War uh, killed 50 million people, many more than anybody thinks uh, that COVID will kill. A terrible state and one that, uh, and, a, and a pandemic that affected international relations for a long time to come. Now, how then might we predict changes to international relations? Uh, a first draft of this presentation ended up as being just a welter of statistics and facts from what happened last time, which I, in the end, threw away. I decided that it was not only indigestible, uh, but might actually be misleading, uh, giving uh, a false sense of accuracy through uh, a great deal of detail. Instead, I want to take perhaps a broader brush approach to predicting these changes and just look at five possible determinants of what happens next. I want to talk about shifts in relative economic strength caused by, by the pandemic. Uh, of course, a lot of political power comes from economic power. So this will be a significant determinant. I want to talk about the reduction in global capital and the way that this is likely to affect uh, the, the world uh, into which we now move. Um, the thirdly, the effectiveness or if you like, the lack of effectiveness of international organizations. Uh, every time, well, almost every time, uh, there is a major shock to the international system. The effectiveness of international structures comes under scrutiny. And the way that the world reacts to uh, perceived successes or perceived failures uh, is often a significant determinant of the, the international relations following that event. Fourthly, uh, a pandemic like this changes perceptions of countries. Uh, it's very easy when you consider international relations to underestimate the importance of soft power. Uh, countries tend to emulate each other. Uh, for a long time, everybody wanted to be like America. Perhaps that's less true now than it was, but I think there's still quite a lot of that around. Uh, and for a long time, uh, people in the developed world wanted somehow or other to be like the countries in the, uh, in the developed world. So people in the underdeveloped world wanted to be like countries in the developed world. So people set up other countries as kind of heroes, role models, destinations to which they aspire. And I think the pandemic will have changed some of that. I'll be talking more in more detail about how uh, in a few minutes. Fifthly, five, fifth point, uh, the changes to the international agenda that the pandemic is almost certain to bring about. Uh, the international agenda uh, in 2019, before the pandemic, was already complex enough, but I suggest that uh, it's likely to undergo significant change following the pandemic and how it changes and how fast uh, I think will be again a significant determinant of the new state of international relations. So those are the five points that I, I, I'd like to discuss. Of course there are many others and if anybody wishes to explore other points uh, in the uh, question and answers I'd be, be very happy to, to look at them with you. Okay, let's Excuse make a start then. Yeah. Excuse me, Mr. Everett, can we have please yes. these slides on the screen? Like on the whole screen, is it possible to, to in, enlarge them? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, on my screen, it's showing its whole screen. Is it not showing its whole screen on yours? You no, know, unfortunately. Okay. Um, what are you getting, Alma? Oh, Just we are getting, yeah, the, the uh, smaller slides on the left and we're getting some properties on the right, like some colors. Right. Okay. Uh, I'm going to try a different approach to these slides. Please bear with me. I'm putting a new set of slides up. Hold on. Thank you. Oh, yeah. 
<clears throat> now it's great. Oh, it was great. Now, yes. now, now it, you've got nothing, I think, yes? Yeah. Okay, hold on. Uh, the view Crystal is again, yeah, quite it. short. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh. Um, is, is it frozen? Uh, no, it's okay. I've just, oh. uh, I think I've done the wrong thing. Hold on. Mm -hmm. One second. Okay, I have you back. Um, I've tried to get a full screen back. Uh -huh. uh, Janet, help me. How do I get back to share screen, please? Okay. Oh, you, you are sharing the okay, screen. okay, okay. I've got, I've got it. Right. Oh, no, it's good. Okay. Is that better? Yeah. Okay, good. Let's go, go with that. Thank you for your patience, everybody. Sorry about the minor technical hitch there, but I think we've overcome it. Good. So as I was saying, um, five points there that I, I think we might want to look at uh, in our discussion today. Let's start with number one, shifts in relative economic strength. Uh, I, I think it's quite clear uh, who the short-term winners are uh, from the, the pandemic. Uh, the People's Republic of China has managed to contain the damage uh, of, from the pandemic, uh, the damage to its economy, much more effectively than most Western countries and significantly much more effectively than the United States of America. Um, there have been other tremendous success stories, uh, largely island states, uh, Taiwan, New Zealand has done very well, and, uh, and a few others. But there have been quite evident disaster areas. I mentioned the United States. Uh, Western Europe has been very badly affected by the pandemic. A uh, large parts of the economy have been damaged by extended lockdowns. And although we tend not to focus on it, Latin America has been ravaged horribly. Uh, places like Mexico, uh, Peru uh, have seen death rates far in excess of those elsewhere. But, but one thing that the various precedents that I was talking about a moment ago have shown us is that it's very important in analyzing the likely effect on international relations and indeed on future economic prosperity come to that, to distinguish between the short and the long term. Uh, the photograph uh, is of a German city, uh, Dresden actually, and it's important to remember that in 1945, uh, people thought that Germany was almost finished, uh, that the place had been so badly wrecked that it would take a, a, a very long time before it recovered. In fact, even Dresden, of course, was in East Germany, uh, which recovered more slowly than the West. Germany roared back. Um, the, in many ways, uh, the pandemic acts like a forest fire. It burns down old trees, and a lot depends on what kind of green shoots what grows out of the ashes of the pandemic. Okay, so what then might determine relative economic strength following the pandemic? There are, again, this is one of those questions that you can discuss at enormous length. I've tried to pin it down uh, simply to, to six points here. Uh, firstly, your starting point. Uh, it, it's better not to suffer too significant economic damage in the first place. Uh, the countries uh, that survived uh, the Black Death in the 14th century uh, found themselves with a much stronger economic basis on which to build than countries uh, which suffered more. And remember that in, in countries in the 14th century that had the Black Death bad, uh, that something like one person in five, 20% 
of the population died. So a tremendous effect, not just on demography, but on the economy. More recently, uh, people quote the example of Sweden, uh, which managed to stay out of the Second World War and ended up in 1945-46 with, uh, with its infrastructure intact and in a much better position than any of the war participants and has managed to build on that to be one of the most prosperous societies in the world today. Secondly, capital and debt levels. It, it needs more than just an act of will to build back. You need money. Uh, you need access to capital or you need to be able to persuade people to lend you money to rebuild. After the Second World War, this was a very significant determinant. Uh, people who had access particularly to American money rebuilt and recovered much faster than those that didn't. It was one of the key determinants of the relative economic performance of the Western Bloc and the socialist countries after the war. The same happened after the Spanish flu. The same happened indeed uh, after the Black Death, uh, that kingdoms, uh, particularly in Western Europe, uh, which were credit worthy, were able to borrow money to recover, uh, to rebuild agriculture in particular, uh, in a way that a lot of other countries simply weren't. Third point, access to markets. This is a particularly difficult point to access to isolate, I'm sorry, in the context of the pandemic, because as we all know, there's a trade war going on between the United States and China. So that market access is likely to depend on all kinds of, of, of factors uh, quite, uh, quite alien to the pandemic itself. But it, if you have access to export markets, you are in a much stronger position to build back, to rebuild your economy after the pandemic than you are uh, if you do not enjoy that access. And it's quite clear that uh, a lot of the countries that have suffered uh, worst from the pandemic are going to be struggling to export. Fourth point, willingness to change. Uh, as it happened, the pandemic has struck in the middle of a technical revolution. Uh, we are watching the introduction of, of 5G communications, uh, driverless cars, uh, non-fossil fuel cars, uh, different forms of energy, and the pandemic has accelerated some of these trends. In particular, uh, it has accelerated the trend away from the office, uh, the Zoom revolution, if you like, which of course we're putting into practice as we speak this evening, or this afternoon if you're in London. Uh, new working practices can be revolutionary, they can unleash tremendous amounts of productivity. Uh, so that the ability to embrace these revolutions and to put them to good effect will, I think, be important in deciding who comes out on top economically in future. Fifth, political cohesion. History teaches us that countries emerging from this kind of crisis that hold together politically, that, remain, that maintain uh, a unified and determined government do much better than countries that collapse into bickering. Uh, that perhaps is a fairly obvious point, but it is nevertheless, I think the history has shown, a significant determinant of the future. And finally, we talk about the, you know, the pandemic sometimes as if it is going to go away. Of course, as all the scientists are telling us, um, COVID is not going to go away. Uh, it will become endemic, uh, rather like other disease, rather like influenza, for example. And it will continue to kill, though, in much lower numbers uh, when we have achieved mass vaccination and probably devise uh, other ways of protecting ourselves against the virus. But it will continue to be a problem. Countries that devise long-term and effective uh, defenses against COVID will find their economies in much better state than those that are weak on this point and that allow recurrences, resurgences, uh, of COVID over long periods of time. This was shown particularly in the case of Spanish flu. Uh, countries that managed to quell it quickly in 1919, 1920, uh, recovered much faster than those that allowed further outbreaks to happen. And there were further outbreaks right through the 20s, often uh, into the 30s in some countries. Okay, that's relative economic strength. I talked a moment ago about the reduction in capital. One of the uh, most damaging effects of this pandemic 
is that it has destroyed huge amounts of capital worldwide. There is quite simply a lot less money to go round than there was in 2019. Governments have drawn down reserves, uh, spent sort of emergency funds, and often uh, put themselves deep into debt to alleviate the effects of COVID. And that money, of course, is, is no longer there. I mean, it would have to be rebuilt by years of productive work. In, when you have an event like this pandemic, uh, it's, there are analogies, if you like, with a stock market. Uh, in some ways, and I don't want to press the analogy too far, uh, nation states tend to behave in international competition in the same way as companies do in stock markets. And the behavior changes depending on whether, well, just as the, the behavior of companies and the, uh, the favor the companies receive from investors changes depending on whether the market is rising or falling. So the same happens in international affairs. Where there is a shortage of capital, where there's no money to go around, capital tends to concentrate itself on safe bets in the developed world, places with uh, well-regulated uh, economies and often with, uh, with well-regulated uh, legal systems. Um, the, uh, that's what happens when the, the, the capital shortage, when there's plenty of money around, then investors uh, tend to be much more prepared to invest in countries that are not so economically central uh, to the world economy. Uh, so this factor is likely to point to a sharp difference in outcome for developed countries as opposed to undeveloped countries, with developed countries likely to show a significant advantage. International organizations. Uh, repeatedly uh, in the history of the last 150 years, uh, international organizations have been found wanting. Um, the, after the First World War, the, which left everybody involved in a state of shock, uh, it was recognized that a better international arrangement than the just conclaves of the great powers was needed to manage world affairs and the League of Nations was born, a clear step towards a more global approach to managing uh, global affairs. After the Second World War, where the League of Nations had been seen to be sadly lacking, uh, a whole raft of new institutions were, were, were founded. The United Nations, of course, the most famous, but also the Bretton Woods institutions, the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. Uh, what, uh, and a lot is going to depend on how we respond to what I think we have to recognize is a further failure of the international institutions this time round. Uh, the signs so far have not been great. Uh, we've seen clear indications of vaccine nationalism as people try to keep vaccines within their own borders for their own people. Uh, we've seen even within what seemed to be the most promising single multilateral experiment in the world, the European Union, a resurrection of national borders against all the, the European rules, uh, where people simply prevented travel across what was supposed to be open borders. Uh, that's one regional organization. Uh, in other regional organizations, I think there's been an almost complete breakdown. Uh, looking around the world, uh, Mercosur in South America did nothing to help its member states during the pandemic. The SADC in Southern Africa inactive. ECOWAS in West Africa, nothing happened. Um, I, I, know, I think a lot of my audience are citizens of a member state of the Commonwealth of Independent States. Now, I'll leave you to decide how effective that multilateral institution has been in dealing with the pandemic, but I suggest that uh, there might be some dissatisfaction there. Overall, when the World Health Organization has been active, but has also been heavily criticized for its role, but the United Nations as a whole has been almost absent. When did any of you last hear of the United Nations Security Council taking rigorous steps uh, in the face of the pandemic? And although there have been tremendous uh, economic consequences to the pandemic, uh, I think you could argue that the major international financial institutions too have not really stepped up to the plate. Uh, where was the IMF? Where was the World Bank when all this was going on? 
so I think a lot of how international relations are going to look after the pandemic is going to depend on our reaction to this. Are we going to rebuild international institutions as we have done after previous wars, um, as we did, in fact, after the Spanish flu pandemic, although it's very difficult to disentangle the effects of that pandemic in this regard from those of the First World War? Or are we going to retreat into uh, non-global nationalism? I've put up there, as you can see, a photograph of President Trump, the great prophet of single state nationalism. Make America great again. Don't use good American money to support uh, failing international institutions. Are we going to see more of this? Or are we going to, as I say, to rebuild institutions that failed us first time around? The fourth point, new perceptions of countries. Countries, citizens have kind of heroes abroad, as I said, but I think some of those heroes have probably been toppled off their pedestals. I think the three big questions that is going to, that are rather going to affect soft power uh, as we look at the future are firstly, whose fault was this in the first place? Now, I am speaking as we have a World Health Organization visit to Wuhan in China, uh, trying to establish where the pandemic started. But most experts, at least at this point, believe that it did indeed start in China, um, either in Wuhan itself or somewhere close by. It's possible that it started spreading in Wuhan and was brought to a different region of China. But if China was responsible for the pandemic, then the Chinese failure to take it seriously at the beginning, to inform the world of its mistake, I think uh, makes for a very difficult narrative. And it's quite clear that the Chinese authorities see the same. They've been very working very hard uh, to, to smother any criticism of China from that regard. Second point, I mentioned vaccine nationalism just now. In the vaccine stage of the pandemic, which countries have hogged vaccines? Which countries have insisted on using their vaccines for only their own citizens? And which countries have been prepared to share? If you are a country that does not have its own supply of vaccine, so you have to get it from elsewhere, this is a very important point. Who has given you vaccine? Who has shown generosity? Who has shown solidarity at this critical stage? The World Health Organization has talked about a moral crisis, strong words. And out of moral crises, you get moral winners and moral losers. And I think it's got to be interesting to see uh, what the perceptions are of who was who. Finally, uh, who dealt well with the pandemic and who dealt badly? Uh, I think it's quite clear that China, despite significant and serious initial failings, has dealt well with the pandemic, uh, with death rates well below those of, of Western countries. Uh, Chinese official figures may not tell the whole story, but even if they underestimate badly, uh, the, the difference between death rates in China and death rates in, for example, the United States are so huge that I think it's quite clear that China has coped better. And you can see that countries like the United States that have simply not done well in dealing with the pandemic have lost prestige, uh, including in China. Uh, it's heartbreaking uh, to hear a previous liberal, democratically inclined Chinese say, well, actually, maybe the American way of doing things isn't as great as we first thought. Maybe there are problems there and maybe there are advantages to our own approach after all. So I think there will be a whole lot of changes in perceptions of countries uh, based on their behavior in the pandemic. Changes to the international event agenda, my fifth point there. Uh, quite obviously, uh, from here on, the, uh, a wish to prevent further pandemics, a wish to prevent anything like this happen ever again, will rise very quickly to the top of the international agenda. Uh, two years ago, it was hardly a footnote. People just didn't take pandemic seriously. That, of course, has changed. But there are other big changes to the international agenda. Climate change and concerns about climate change, which were on the rise in any case before the pandemic hit, I think has soared up the agenda. The photograph there is of New York City, 
with a blue sky and no traffic. Uh, anybody who knows New York will recognize just how unlikely and unusual that is. But people having been treated to clean air uh, in previously filthy cities and being treated to being able to uh, walk along streets without constant traffic noise seem to have decided that they like this and they want their governments to do more in that regard. Other points uh, to the, the changes to the international agenda. Uh, there's been a lot of concern that so much of the uh, fight against COVID-19 has been led by pharmaceutical companies, who, some of whom have done very well, some of whom have been very generous uh, offering vaccine at cost uh, to people who wouldn't otherwise be able to afford it. But I think there's a lot of concern that a thing as important as a pandemic should not be left just to the private sector, that there needs to be more regulation of the pharmaceutical industry. And if that bandwagon starts to uh, gather speed, it's likely that it's going to uh, be in a, perhaps greater regulation for other industries too, perhaps. Finally, a, a point. Uh, the international agenda, of course, is driven by diplomats, of which I, I used to be one. How many more big diplomatic meetings are we going to see? Or are we now moving into the era of Zoom summits, where people no longer get on aircraft to see each other, but simply log into Zoom to talk? Um, I've been through the five points of the way I think that the pandemic might change uh, international relations. I started uh, this with a discussion of what other than the pandemic might change international relations. Uh, this slide is the corollary of that. What other than international relations might that pandemic change? This is slightly off subject, but I, I hope you'll bear with me for a moment. Uh, it's quite clear uh, even outside the ambit of international relations that the pandemic is going to change a great deal. People are talking about the death of the office, uh, even if uh, people still go into the office for face-to-face -face meeting from time to time. It does seem likely that now that we've all learned to work from home, that this new skill is going to be applied in future. It means that you can work uh, without having to get on uh, your, your transport and go to the office without having to commute. Uh, and it means that you can take breaks and you know, go and walk the dog or deal with your children uh, in between work tasks. Following from that, uh, for a long time, the tech industry has said that, they, that we are moving to an era of truly global companies. One of the effects of the Zoom revolution is to accelerate this because if you have a workforce that is not physically any longer going to an office, uh, you can take them any way you like. It, it doesn't matter whether somebody is physically sitting in London or Almaty. You can have a global company, a virtual company, people dialing into Zoom meetings from all over the world and run an international business drawing all the best talent from everywhere. That would be something of a revolution. I mentioned just now uh, the new emphasis on climate. I um, I, I see that all around me. Um, people are taking to bicycles and walking everywhere uh, rather than, uh, than, than driving cars. Indeed, given the way that the pandemic has accelerated the rise of climate change uh, up the international agenda, how will it still be socially or acceptable or even legal to drive a petrol fueled car in 10 years time? We'll see. Finally, I put there, almost as a joke at the end, the end of takeaway coffee. Uh, widespread domestic skilling, people who've learned to make coffee themselves rather than go to Starbucks and buy it all, because of course, Starbucks in most Western countries has had to close down. With that new skill set, um, are we actually going to be just more self-reliant than we were before the pandemic? Let's see. Okay, so quite a lot there to think about, and I, I'm conscious that I, I'm, I'm running out of time here, but a few general conclusions. The first one is, as I've got on the slide there, the repercussions of this pandemic on international relations will be complex, multifaceted, and very difficult to predict. Uh, I think maybe this time next year, we will have a rather clearer idea of how uh, all these dice are going to land. But as we are now, I, I hope I've given you a kind of toolkit of things to watch uh, to, that are likely to uh, be the determinants of international relations. 
But at the moment, it's just too difficult, I think, to say where some of those dynamics are going to lead us. Um, second point, sadly, I suspect that uh, COVID-19, uh, capital shortage, differential economic development, that it is going to uh, worsen the divide between richer and poorer nations. Poorer nations are going to find it difficult to secure the capital they need to develop. Uh, act markets are may well be more protected and richer countries are probably going to, to pull away from poorer ones, reversing the trend that we've seen over recent years. I think this could be hugely damaging. Um, final point there, uh, that it's important not to jump to conclusions about the long-term based on short-term changes. The short-term and the long-term may well prove to be very different. Countries that do well in the short term may not do so well in the long term and vice versa. Uh, it, a lot will depend not on what happens during the pandemic, but what happens immediately afterwards. Okay, I'm, thank you for your patience. I'm sorry to have spoken at such, such length there, uh, but I'd be very happy to take questions. I'm going to leave you just with a picture of the coronavirus on one hand and the world on the other. Two big globes, two uh, uh, two circles that interact in such significant ways. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. John Everett. And uh, the um, floor is open to the questions, and we have several questions uh, in our chat. So Aizat Nurshataeva is asking, how do you think the pandemic will affect migration? I think it will slow migration. I think that uh, even when the worst of the pandemic is over, uh, that curbs aimed at preventing resurgences of COVID-19 and particularly variants of COVID-19, as we are now learning, uh, the virus itself is, uh, is mutating into more, more, more dangerous forms. I think they will be in place for a long time. Uh, I think travel will become more difficult and I think migration uh, will become a great deal more difficult. Uh, that uh, even countries that have, have effectively run open borders uh, up until now are likely to close them, uh, which will make it very difficult for people trying to seek work in countries outside their own. I'm sorry. There is another very interesting question from uh, some anonymous participant. Is it possible ah. that America and other countries will call for compensation from China. I, some Americans have already done so. Uh, China has responded by saying that it thinks that the virus actually originated in America, uh, a, a search for which there doesn't seem to be any evidence whatever. Uh, I, I'm not sure that America will actually formally demand compensation. Uh, but I think there will be an expectation that China, as it were, having landed us all in this mess, uh, goes above and beyond uh, the efforts of other countries in efforts to sort it out. There is the uh, question from Almira Babakbergen. Uh, how do you think has pandemic rallied the world to fight with disease or has it alienated the countries from each other? Will close border situation, with close border situation. Mm -hmm. Well, this is one of the questions I was trying to address. Uh, I, I think in the short term, certainly uh, we will see closed borders. Uh, in the longer term, I think it's too early to say whether the, the shock to world society will cause us to work more closely together as we have done in the face of previous shocks or uh, to draw down and to hunker down as it were uh, behind national borders. Uh, a lot will depend I think on the actions of the incoming US administration. It's the kind of thing uh, to where people will look to America uh, for a, a lead. Um, and I, I think it's just what it's said at this stage. Uh, another very interesting question um, from Dr. Fisher. 
who is asking, mm-hmm. how has COVID affected the relationship between Britain and the EU? Ah, uh, the effect has been complex. Uh, firstly, uh, the, the, the United Kingdom has been much faster uh, in vaccinating its population than the European Union. Uh, there are 60 something million of us and 13 million have already been vaccinated in this country. Uh, so that is, uh, well, you can work it out, uh, about 20%. Uh, it's been a, a very rapid outbreak, a very bad progress. In the EU, uh, something like 3% of the population have, only, have been vaccinated. And this has caused a certain amount of tension uh, as uh, EU citizens have said, why is it the British so much faster than we are? What have we done wrong? Uh, the, there's also been a minor spat over vaccine transfers. Some of the vaccine used in the United Kingdom is actually manufactured in Europe. And you may recall that a few weeks ago, uh, there were calls by uh, by some Europeans to, to keep all vaccine manufactured within the European Union, inside the European Union for vaccination there. Uh, that idea was discarded in the end, but of course caused a certain amount of tension. Uh, overall, I think there's been a, a short term to ripple in the relationship as Britain and the European Union have taken quite different courses in terms of vaccination, uh, but there's been a repeated uh, declarations of a wish to work together closely against uh, COVID-19 in future. Uh, so I'm hoping that that is the, the wish that will take precedence. And actually there is one more interesting question from one of our active participants. How international relation in post pandemic world can be improved by younger generation? What do you think about that? They, they can, I, I would put the question, if you like, more strongly. Uh, they can only be improved by the younger generation. Um, the, I, I mean, the future is for the younger today. You know, this is your world, uh, uh, not mine. I, 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 I've already retired from diplomacy. How, what advice would I give uh, the up and coming generation who are going to have to live with the effects of the pandemic? Firstly, trust each other and talk to each other. Do not draw up barriers between nations. Uh, this is a thoroughly bad idea. Uh, facing uh, something like the pandemic, uh, just as in so many other international problems, it is vital to keep cooperating, to exchange notes and to share information and skills. And I very much hope that the upcoming generation can do this. It will be an uphill struggle because the first reflex of a lot of people uh, seeing uh, countries around them infested with the virus is to close borders. That's understandable in the short term, but I very much hope that the younger generation can avoid that happening in the long term. There is one more question from Aziza Naurizbaeva. Uh, she is writing, thanks for the lecture. Uh, we know that each country coped uh, with the pandemic in its own way. In your opinion, which country's regulations were the most effective and helped the country to cope with pandemic with the least losses? If I had to pick an absolute star, it would be Taiwan. Uh, Taiwan has the advantage of being an island, uh, so you can control access uh, more easily than you can in a landlocked country. Uh, but uh, the, the, the secret of Taiwan's success was to react very quickly, not to give the virus time to take hold, and to have a track and trace system, uh, a test and trace system, I'm sorry, uh, that was effective and determined, so that if you were, were found to have the virus in Taiwan, straight away uh, the authorities would devise a list of all the people you've been in contact with and isolate them. Um, China has uh, done something of the same, uh, but Taiwan has been even more effective. Other countries have done well. New Zealand has adopted something of the, the same uh, technique. And I think it's important to point to these two examples because uh, the Chinese have been trying to claim that effective, uh, the effective defense against COVID uh, is easier under a police state like China than it is in a democracy. Taiwan and New Zealand show that that simply is not true, uh, that these two open societies, open democracies, have actually done better at coping uh, with the virus than is China. 
countries that have done badly, I'm afraid that I'm sitting in one. Uh, in, in the United Kingdom, uh, over 100,000 people have died of the virus, which in, in terms of death by population is much worse than, uh, than, than most other countries. I think it's something like three times the death rate that you've had in Kazakhstan. Where did we go wrong? Firstly, uh, our government, I think, now quietly admits that it was much too slow. Speed is of the essence. Faced with a pandemic, you have to react fast. Uh, also, that it was hesitant, that even when it recognised that uh, there was a pandemic, it didn't lock down hard enough or fast enough. And interestingly, in the United Kingdom, uh, it's become clear that ordinary people were actually much more in favour of rigorous, hard measures against the pandemic than the government itself was. The government was frightened of offending people. In fact, people were way ahead of the government. They wanted a lockdown early and they wanted it hard, but they didn't get it with tragic consequences. There is one more question uh, from Camila Mirvanova. She's saying, hello, Mr. Everett. Thank you for fascinating hello, and relevant presentation. Returning back to the theme of vaccines, what do you think about the vaccine of Russia Sputnik V or America's Moderna? Is it effective or can it be also sense of a competition between countries? It, there's a great deal of politics in vaccines. You're quite right to pose the question. Uh, I think the I, I think the Moderna trials uh, speak for themselves. Uh, Moderna have produced a, a, a very effective vaccine. The problem with Sputnik V was that uh, no convincing test data were released for a long time, which meant that people simply didn't know uh, whether Sputnik V worked or not. And naturally, uh, people uh, in and outside Russia were therefore a little uh, shy about it. But over the last, what, two weeks maybe, we have got hold of reliable test data, and it turns out that Sputnik V is actually a good vaccine. 92% effectiveness, we reckon. And this was uh, published by The Lancet, the, the British medical journal, uh, not by a Russian source. And so uh, it has no political axe to grind. It's just a pity that we didn't know this weeks ago. Uh, I think this would have encouraged a lot of people to have the, the vaccine. But Sputnik V uh, looks to be effective. What in the two? In fact, the majority of the Western produced vaccines, although they, they work in different ways and have slightly different levels of, of efficacy, uh, seem to be a, a good defense against the vaccine. So too do the Chinese vaccines. Uh, you hear less of those, uh, but they have been tested rigorously. Uh, we know they work, but they, they tend not to be used outside China because of course China trying to vaccinate its own huge, huge population needs every drop of vaccine that it can get. And not a lot of these vaccines are leaving China right now. Thank you very much. And uh, we have very interesting question from Aidana Shamotova. What are the major challenges that developing countries face in post pandemic? Are they different from pre pandemic challenges? Yes, yeah. the most immediate challenge that you face is shortage of world capital. Uh, I, I put up when I was talking about this, uh, a, a photograph of a famous mine in Kazakhstan, you, you might have recognized it, uh, largely developed with, uh, with, with capital from, from outside. Uh, doing that in the next few years is going to be really quite difficult. Uh, the world is short of capital. Capital has been burnt in huge quantities to deal with the pandemic. Uh, this is going to be a major challenge. Uh, both as developing countries seek to pursue uh, development plans that were in existence before the pandemic and to repair the economic damage of the pandemic itself. And as I said uh, in the, my uh, pre-penultimate slide, uh, this is likely to mean, I'm afraid, that the economic performance of developed and less developed countries is likely to diverge further following the pandemic than it did before. Uh, here is another question from Dr. Fisher. Uh, it seems clear that it is not the last epidemic. How can we prepare better as a world community? Should there be another Bretton Woods conference? This time was an emphasis on fighting future pandemics. What do you think? I don't know whether the way forward would be a conference, although I can, I can see uh, quite strong arguments for that. Um, I think if you held a conference on pandemics right now, 
it would sadly degenerate very quickly into a slanging match as everybody tried to blame everybody else uh, for this current pandemic. So if you have a conference, maybe best to wait till temper's cool a bit. Uh, how should we cope with future, uh, future pandemics? You're quite right, this won't be the last. Uh, firstly, lessons learned. Uh, I, I think sharing a best practice. Uh, governments need to prepare proper plans for pandemics. Uh, a lot of governments were caught with no workable plan in place at all. Uh, they need to understand the need to act fast. They need to understand the, the need to share information at an early stage. Uh, while the Chinese government uh, was quite unhelpfully uh, trying to shift blame for what happened off China's shoulders, Chinese scientists, in a remarkable display of international solidarity, were working through the night to sequence uh, the, the the genome of the uh, of, of the virus, and uh, that work proved invaluable in helping everybody to develop vaccine. It was a major Chinese contribution. It's interesting that, uh, in general, countries that have had to fight previous uh, serious illnesses did much better at fighting this pandemic than countries that did not have that experience. So, for example. Uh, South Korea, to take one, uh, which had to fight off the SARS epidemic uh, a few years ago, knew what to do faced with the disease. They knew the importance of test and trace. They knew the importance of isolating uh, all cases. And you get a, a kind of, uh, just as individuals have a vaccine, so societies are kind of vaccinated by one pandemic against the next. You know what to do, you know it's serious, and you know how to act. So I hope very much that these lessons can be carried forward. Yes, and we have one more question from anonymous attendee. Uh, thank you for the great uh, talk. My question is how the pandemic will affect the hegemony of US and the world? And uh, will China surpass the US in economy in the future, in the close future? That is a very difficult question to answer because the future of US hegemony uh, depends on so many other things than the pandemic. Uh, I, I, whatever happens over the next 10 years, whatever time scale you want to name, I think it's going to be very difficult to disentangle uh, which effects were caused by the pandemic and which were caused by, for example, tensions in American society, uh, the sharp divisions in American politics, uh, the effects of rivalry, uh, economic and military come to that uh, with other countries, notably China. Do I think the Chinese economy is going to overtake the US economy? Uh, well, it, if current trends continue, yes, it will. I mean, that's not a political judgment. That's just a question of arithmetic. But of course, we can't be sure that they will. One thing the pandemic has taught us is that the world can change very significantly and very suddenly without notice. And that could affect uh, the relative economic performances of China and the United States as much as any other uh, world relationship. I mentioned earlier that China is brittle. You cannot simply assume that China continues to develop at its current relatively rapid pace or that uh, the current uh, success that China enjoys will continue into the future. Uh, the future remains unpredictable. Uh, and it's it's quite possible that the Chinese economy will overtake the US, but it's not a certainty. Thank you. And there is one more question from Zirye Irlan, which is actually another one. Does anti-vaccine activists pose a serious threat to global recovery after pandemic? I think they posed a serious regional threat to recovery from the pandemic. Um, the phenomenon though is probably too localized uh, to affect the long-term trajectory of a global recovery. Uh, Anti-vaxxers tend to contradict a certain country that France uh, has a very strong tradition of refusal to take the vaccine. Um, Russia has had one, but I think that was largely because people just didn't trust the Sputnik V 
vaccine. And now that it's been shown uh, externally to be a good vaccine, uh, maybe the take up rate will become faster. Uh, in countries that are more vulnerable, uh, it, throughout South America, uh, throughout Latin America, come to that, throughout Sub Saharan Africa, and I think throughout most of, uh, of Asia, uh, anti vax movements have been much weaker, and take up rates of the vaccine have been much higher. And I think that provided that doesn't change, uh, that the chances of a a, a global recovery, a vaccine-led recovery from the pandemic uh, remain good, and th these are unlikely to be derailed uh, by anti-vax movements in some countries. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Evert. Uh, there is the question from Irna Bahati. Uh, thank you for the amazing presentation. I would like to ask a question regarding the island of Taiwan. Uh, as you know, Taiwan has been doing really good. Uh, in, in fight of uh, in fight against COVID-19, and it actually is one of the few countries that already live in their normal lives, like pre-COVID times. How do you think the future international relations perspective between Taiwan and the other countries? Do you think that Taiwan will gain more support from the rest of the world in the near future? I yes, I, I think. Firstly, I think that. Uh, a lot of countries have been impressed by what Taiwan has achieved in fighting the, the virus. Uh, of course, relations with Taiwan are always complicated by the actions of the People's Republic of China. And uh, just a week ago, uh, the People's Republic put out a statement saying that a declaration of independence by Taiwan would lead to war. So a lot of saber rattling. And countries know uh, that if they are openly too close to Taiwan, they risk their relations with the People's Republic of China, uh, which are often bound up with lucrative trade and uh, which are important to their economy. So the hesitancy, I think, will continue. Will Taiwan's success in fighting the vaccine therefore mean uh, a wider international net, mean more countries having close relations with Taiwan? No. I doubt that, but I think it might well slow the loss of uh, diplomatic allies that, China, that uh, Taiwan has suffered over recent years. I mean, uh, various countries have uh, changed their recognition uh, from Taiwan to the People's Republic, and I think that process will, will slow. And I think it might encourage some countries to, uh, to push the margin just a bit, maybe to develop closer relations with Taiwan provided they are satisfied that the People's Republic is not going to respond too vigorously to any such effort. A lot depends, of course, on the actions of the United States, uh, which has a particular relation with Taiwan. Uh, I think if President Biden makes clear that he intends to stand by US commitments to Taiwan and to continue to protect Taiwan against China, that, that will encourage others to develop closer relations. Thank you so much. And actually, there is another question which is in line with this one, maybe to some extent. Thank you, Ambassador Everett. Thank you for your lecture. This is from Ulan Nukan. What do you think U.S. post-pandemic strategy in Central Asia, especially in Kazakhstan under Biden administration? What do you think of wow. the U.S. Um, post-pandemic strategy in Central strategy Asia? To, to, towards Kazakhstan. Yeah, especially in Kazakhstan, under Biden administration. Don't know. Uh, I, on this, frankly, I can guess, but my guess is probably not much better than a guess that you might be able to make. Uh, so far, the Biden administration has said very little about what it intends to do in Central Asia. Uh, it's clear that the, the broad outlines of US diplomacy uh, will look much more like uh, the approach taken by the Obama administration than uh, those taken by the Trump administration, which suggests a much greater degree of traditional diplomatic involvement uh, in Central Asia in other areas too. Uh, probably a lot of support for allies uh, and uh, probably too uh, a, a, a greater willingness to allow uh, US companies to invest if of course, as I say, uh, the money is there for them uh, to invest, which may not be the case given the capital burn the pandemic has caused. Uh, inevitably, uh, Central Asia and US relations with Central Asia 
are going to be affected by US relations with China. Uh, as China uh, seeks to expand its, its influence, uh, it's going to come right up against US influence in Central Asia. And I, I just don't know how that kind of standoff is going to play out. Actually, there is another question, sorry, Omar, related to this, I mean, to Biden's uh, uh, presidency uh, from Mr. Daniel Mashaka. He's asking, do you think that Joe Biden's presidency will decrease vaccine nationalism in Europe? No, I don't. Uh, vaccine nationalism in Europe, uh, I think, has, has roots that are not going to be touched by any action by the United States. Uh, the... I, I think when you hear, for example, uh, members of the, the German Bundestag you know, demand that borders be shut, uh, that Germans be vaccinated with German produced vaccine before anybody else, uh, that was a, a knee jerk reaction uh, to a, I don't think crisis is too strong a word, of lack of vaccine uh, and lack of vaccine rollout uh, in Germany. And it's very hard to see how any action or inaction. Uh, by the Biden administration is going to affect this kind of attitude. Thank you very much. And uh, there is also one more question about Kazakhstan. Uh, Bakit Gould uh, Togbergenova is asking, where do you think uh, a developing country such as Kazakhstan will be in the post-pandemic world? Is it likely to, to drift towards more powerful states? Quite vague question. Yeah. I... I think a lot depends on the relative size and power of the state involved. Kazakhstan is, is a big place, not, not just in terms of territory, of course, it has huge territory, but uh, the population is not negligible and it has a reasonably developed economy. Uh, I don't, I mean, whether or not Kazakhstan moves closer to other countries, um, of course, it's going to be a Kazakh decision, but I don't think there's a necessity uh, for that in, uh, in current international relations. And as far as I can see, uh, that necessity is unlikely to arise for in the immediate future either. Um, I think Kazakhstan might well be able to continue with its current international positioning for some time to come. Whether it wants to do that, of course, is a strategic decision to be, uh, to be taken in Kazakhstan. Uh, on which I'm not well positioned to comment. There, there are actually several questions which are kind of interrelated to each other. If you don't mind, I would read two questions simultaneously together. I mean, in the group, one is from um, Aziza Norisbaeva. She's asking, we know that each country coped with the pandemic in its own way. In your opinion, which country's regulation were the most effective and help the country to cope with the pandemic with the least losses. And there is another question from Alwa Panshkali. She's also asking, what mistakes did we make when we fought the pandemic? Was it right to lock people in their homes? Okay. Uh, with the best, uh, uh, we're talking ab ab about related subjects just a few minutes ago. As, as I said then, I, I think, you know, if you want to, to bring out heroes, then. Taiwan, New Zealand, uh, some of the smaller island states, they did really, really well. Um, and at the other end of the scale, uh, the United States has done badly, the United Kingdom has done worse. Uh, what did we do right? What did we do wrong? I th think it's now clear that the, the key thing, the, the, the key determinant in uh, the effectiveness of a response to the pandemic was the speed and determination of reaction. Uh, the countries that reacted quickly before the virus had a chance to take hold in uh, populations uh, and which reacted in a determined manner, insisting that everybody who had been in contact with the case should be isolated, have done much better at controlling it uh, than countries that took a, a more liberal uh, approach, if you like. Uh, was it right to lock people in their homes? Yes, I think it was. Uh, I, I, I mean, I think it was a terrible thing to have to do, but I believe that forced isolation of that kind uh, was the single most effective weapon uh, that we had against the pandemic. And that using it early and using it firmly uh, really did have an effect in preventing the spread 
of pandemics uh, under governments that will prepare to do those things. Thank you very much. And uh, there is one more very interesting question from Dr. Nijat Kapar. Uh, one thing COVID-19 has shown was the complete inability of the international system to deal with the pandemic collectively. Uh, what can be done in the future to deal uh, with such a problem more collectively and uh, those more effectively? Okay, we were talking a minute ago about whether we need a, a new Bretton Woods conference uh, on pandemics. As I say, that when tempers have cooled, uh, that might be one answer. Uh, the international system already does have tools to deal with pandemics. They are vested in the World Health Organization. The trouble is that those tools didn't really work. Uh, the World Health Organization was, I think, too slow off the mark. Uh, the, it didn't declare a pandemic until some weeks after it was clear to everybody else that a pandemic was well underway. Nor, crucially, did it issue clear guidelines about what to do. If the World Health Organization uh, in December 2019, January 2020, had said this, everybody, please, please, please listen, this is really serious, a lot of people are going to die, to deal with this pandemic, you have to do the following, and then say, you know, lockdown, isolate, test and trace, all the things that we've learned to do individually since then. That would have been a major contribution to keeping the pandemic at bay. But the World Health Organization didn't do that. It should have done. And I hope that in a future pandemic, it, it would do that. But for that, it needs political backing. Um, the Trump administration criticized the World Health Organization for being too soft on China. Uh, Maybe, uh, I, I, I think the jury is still out on that, but it certainly showed signs of softness where it should have been really quite strident and insisted uh, that, uh, that, that member states uh, do something quickly. Uh, it was much more soft-spoken. Uh, so I, one thing that I hope will come out of this pandemic is that the World Health Organization gets the political backing it needs next time round to advise in a decisive manner and to give assistance to member states uh, in their efforts to deal with the future pandemic. Actually, to some extent, you kind of answered that question already, but there is another similar question from a student. Uh, do you, Baglan Tleshev, do you think that discrimination of Asians will increase in Europe due to the fact that COVID-19 originates from China? The, the, the racial discrimination, I'm saying. Yes. So here is a very interesting question from another student. I do. I do. Yeah. Yes. Sure. Uh, uh, from Mr. Eldar Kassiana. I don't think so. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, okay. Are there any no, no, ideas? No, no, no. Go on. Sorry. Are there any ideas on what is the size of footprint left by the recent pandemic to the history of humanity? May it be the starting point for reconsideration of values or something like global uh, space colonization? Let me start looking for other, I don't know, That's a planets to idea. live in. <laughs> yes, preferably planets where you don't get uh, coronavirus, I suppose. Uh, I wonder, it may be, it's a very interesting idea. And um, it, it, you're quite right. It's the kind of event that might stimulate people to think in exactly those ways. Uh, the, if we look back at the effect uh, of previous events, which might in some ways be comparable to the current pandemic, uh, you see uh, that one of the effects of the Spanish flu was a great surge in migration in the 20s and 30s. I mean, of course, there were other issues too. Uh, there was a lot of economic pressure uh, to migrate, but a lot of people who found themselves in countries uh, which had suffered from the Spanish flu very badly, uh, wanted out, they wanted to go somewhere where they were less likely to be killed uh, by the disease. Uh, and a lot of people simply moved country. Important to remember that Spanish flu uh, killed over 50 million people, so many more. Uh, than we hope uh, COVID-19 is going to kill. Uh, so a really big shock uh, to societies. Um, but, uh, and, and I think you, know, you could understand the wish to move out 
to go to different places expressed at that time in migration and as the questioner suggests possibly future in greater space research let's see Thank you very much. And there is one more question from Aizat Nurshataiva. It's about Russian Federation. Uh, do you think that Western countries will warm up to Putin as his regime now uh, that the Sputnik V vaccine has been shown to be effective? So the Western countries and Putin. I think. Uh, so do you think the Western countries will, will be kind to Putin? Yeah, or? yeah war, warm up, yeah, kind to Putin. Yeah. Oh, we're warm up. No, I no, I don't. Um, I I suppose uh, that we have to admit that the the, the West uh, is comfortable on vaccine. This, I mean, or as I said, the European Union has not done well in distributing it. But in general, the West can produce the, the vaccines it needs. It doesn't need the Sputnik V uh, vaccine uh, to supplement other vaccines produced elsewhere. Uh, I don't detect any softening towards Putin. Uh, in Western governments. Uh, on the contrary, um, at the moment, if you if you discuss Putin with Western politicians, as I hear often in discussion programs, uh, the issue they focus on isn't uh, Sputnik V, the successful vaccine. Uh, it's Navalny. Uh, there's general uh, horror at the way that Navalny has been treated and the way that Putin has increased repression in Russia. And I think that is likely to be the dominant theme rather than any kind of warning because of the vaccine. Actually, there is another question related to Russia and its vaccine. Can we trust Russian vaccine? And in the brackets, the country that falsifies the results of doping at the Olympics, possibly bought the holding of the World Cup and poisoned its own citizens? I mean, is it likely that they gave their own results or statistics on vaccine trials to the Lancet and to the all scientific society? Good question. Uh I, the Lancet has a reputation for treating any data that is given to it very carefully. And I'm sure the editors uh, will have been aware uh, of the possibility of falsified trials. Uh, they nevertheless chose to publish the results and, and to endorse it. I, I'm not, I can't tell you uh, what processes they went through to check the facts as presented them, to them by, by, by Russia, uh, whether, for example, they were able to test the vaccine independently. They may well have been able to. Um, I can only tell you what, what conclusions they came to. Uh, it, but in, in general, yes, of course. I mean, we know that Russia uh, falsifies all kinds of things and is capable of doing terrible things uh, just to protect its own reputation. Whether it did so in this instance, I'm sorry, I, I, I don't know. I, I suspect that uh, the, the fact that the Lancet has endorsed the vaccine uh, should carry considerable weight, but I can't say more than that. Thank you very much. And we have uh, one more question from Anonymous attendee, and uh, I guess this is the student. Uh, in your opinion, will uh, European Union open its borders for tourists and exchange students coming from CIS countries? Not in the short term. I think uh, uh, one of your colleagues asked about migration uh, at the beginning of this Q&A session. And I indicated then that I, I, I think for the time being uh, that moving between countries for whatever purpose uh, is going to be difficult. And uh, you know, moving to a country for, uh, for, for as an exchange student, uh, I think there'll be some caution on. Uh, but I, that, one of the points I, I hope I've conveyed uh, in my presentation is the importance of distinguishing the short term from the long term. Uh, even if we go through a period where it is more difficult than it has been to be an exchange student, a CIS exchange student in the European Union. That doesn't matter. That that's, that doesn't mean rather that that situation is going to remain for for the long term. Um, I think longer term, you know, the European Union wants to encourage links uh, with the CIS. Uh, it wants to help CIS citizens uh, to. To, to take skills uh, back to their countries and his instincts will be to facilitate uh, student schemes of, of one kind or another uh, with the CIS but how in practice that might play out I, I don't think we can say. There is another question from one of our colleagues, uh, Agrim, she's asking 
Dear Mr. Everard, how do you th see the role of World Health Organization during post-pandemic period? To be honest, uh, I suspect that the World Health Organization will um, will go through a period of internal restructuring and reflection that uh, when the worst of the pandemic is over, it will suddenly go very quiet. I think it's internally as well as externally, it has a lot of questions to answer. Clearly, a lot of things didn't go right uh, during this, perhaps this, this biggest single test that the World Health Organization has ever faced. And it is going to want to draw into itself, to learn lessons, to restructure, so that it is better able to, to cope with the pandemic. Uh, I think in the, post, in the immediate post-pandemic period, uh, the international organizations that are likely to, or at the very least ought to come to the fore, are the financial ones. The, the, the main challenge is going to be economic reconstruction, uh, which points to a significant role for the World Bank and for the IMF. So far, both have, as I said, have been very, very quiet. I hope that changes and I hope that they now become rather more active. And there is one more question, although it doesn't really relate to the uh, uh, politics. Uh, thank you for the valuable information that you have shared here. Uh, what do you think, what are the options to create some international business with the USA based on the current situation uh, related to COVID? I, I, I'm not sure how far the, the pandemic changes openings for doing business with the USA. Uh, I mean, clearly, if you are in the pharmaceutical industry, uh, that's not true. Uh, there will be all kinds of, of new and exciting openings. But uh, I think the assumption is, is going to be that when the US finally gets around to vaccinating its people to creating a proper herd immunity uh, uh, against the, the virus, uh, that it, the U.S. economy will go back to something like uh, the normality we observed before. There will be changes, certainly, uh, but the, the opportunities that there always have been uh, for different companies outside the United States to trade with, to do business with that country, uh, will return uh, quite possibly in ways that will be familiar to anybody who is doing business with the United States in 2019. Uh, if uh, if I may kind of combine several questions into one group of questions, which is Please. actually about vaccine in general. Yeah. Uh, the question from Chinggis, uh, who is asking which vaccine will be the most efficient among all available. And uh, from Nurjan, kind of related to that, uh, he's asking that since Kazakhstan is already in a green zone, do we need to take a vaccine or not? And uh, what do you think, uh, what kind of risks are there? And the so, uh, interesting thing is that um, more kind of philosophical kind of, uh, what do you think, what will replace globalization and what will, what will humanity be like after the coronavirus pandemic? Wow, the, the second question is absolutely huge. We could spend hours talking about that. Let me try to answer the first question first. Uh, I think uh, you, you can look up the, the effective if the rates of effectiveness uh, of the, the, the different vaccines. Uh, the, uh, faced with the, should we call it the, the, the basic form of COVID-19, the one uh, that first spread uh, from Wuhan, uh, I think I'm right in saying that the single most effective ones are the Pfizer and uh, the AstraZeneca uh, vaccines. But the trouble is that that number keeps moving because the vaccine is mutating. And because, uh, sorry, not, not the vaccine, the virus is mutating. Uh, and because the, the vaccines are structured differently, uh, they all try to cope with the virus in different ways. Different vaccines will be more or less effective against different mutations of the virus. So, for example, which vaccine is going to be most effective against the virus this time next year, when we may find that I don't know, the South African or the Kent variant of the virus has become uh, more predominant. Uh, we just can't say at the moment. Uh, also, of course, just as the virus mutates, so the vaccines too are changing. The AstraZeneca vaccine, uh, they are producing a, a new version uh, this autumn. Uh, it's a constant game of cat and mouse. Uh, so there's no clear answer to that question. You just have to, to keep watching 
the test results coming through to see uh, how each vaccine is responding to different mutations. If you are in Kazakhstan, in the green zone, as you rightly point out, uh, is it worth having the vaccine? Certainly, if it were my decision, I, I would have it anyway. Uh, the, although Kazakhstan is currently in the green zone, who knows what is going to happen in future, and it is well to be protected. Uh, I, I say that easily because I'm British, I'm going to get a free vaccine in a couple of weeks in any case. Um, but uh, even though that's not the case, I think I will seek it out. What are you going to be like? If you like, that is, uh, comes close to being a different way of asking the question with which I have been wrestling uh, during this presentation. Uh, I mean, international relations are simply a, a global extension of like of interpersonal relations. What are we all going to be like with each other? Uh, I hope, and I stress hope rather than no, that the shock of the pandemic is going to bring us all together, both institutions uh, in more effective international communal organizations uh, and in more effective ways of working together against the world's problems. Uh, I fear, however, that it might isolate us, that the shock of the pandemic is going to cause uh, people, families, as well as nations to draw behind locked doors. After all, we've all had a lot of practice, at least we have in the West, of you know, living in an isolated way. Uh, we haven't been able to mix with people uh, for, for quite some time. And I fear those habits uh, may take long-term root. I hope I'm wrong. Thank you very much, Mr. Everett. Unfortunately, we are running out of time. So is it possible to ask the last question? Um, although, you know, very similar questions have already been asked today, Admira Bagbergen is asking, can the world after the pandemic be as it was before? And uh, how long will it take to recover? No, the world cannot be as it was before. You cannot go through an event of this kind and simply return to a pre-existing normality. Uh, the world will change. Uh, I, 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 in one of the slides, I tried to explore some of the ways in which it might change. Uh, these, both the direction of the changes that I discussed are difficult to predict. And I'm sure that there'll be all kinds of changes that neither I nor probably anybody else has thought of. The one thing we can almost be certain of is the world in future uh, will not be the same. I'm sorry, there was a second half of the question. Remind me, please. How long will it take to recover? That will depend a great deal on where you are. I think some countries will recover very quickly. Um, the Western Europeans are well poised to get back to where they were at the end of 2019 in maybe a year. I mean, that is the current prediction. Latin American countries will take a lot longer. Their economies have been badly devastated. What will happen in Central Asia? Which I know is a question close to the hearts of many of the people uh, today. I, I just don't know. I, I mean, a lot depends, of course, on whether Kazakhstan, for example, remains in the green zone, remains relatively unaffected uh, by the vaccine, by the, by the virus, or whether uh, it's caught by a further surge uh, in the virus later on. And there's no hope for it. And it depends, as I've indicated, on how easy it, it becomes to get access to, to capital uh, for the future. These are unknowables, but I doubt if, um, but if, if so, like Kazakhstan is hit by the virus badly, I fear it might take quite some time to recover. Okay, Mr. John Everett, so thank you very much. And on behalf of the um, all the participants and guests today, I would like to say uh, by the words that were used today the most, thank you very much for the amazing lecture. And uh, we would like to wish you all the best in your all your future projects. And uh, we wish all of us yeah, to recover very fast from the COVID. And, um, uh, we hope to see you offline someday at KMF University. Uh, you will be very welcome to join us uh, for various types of lectures or conferences. Thank you very much. Albert, thank, thank you for so those very kind words. Thank you, everybody, uh, for, for, for listening. I'm sorry that I ended the last question on downbeat notes. Uh, uh, to be more upbeat, I mean, the, 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 the pandemic destroys a lot of old structures, gives you, young people, the chance to build new ones. 
I hope you'll grasp the opportunity and build a fine and better new world. Thank you all for your time. Thank you for listening. Thank, Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.